Hello everyone, this is Shane Gebauer with Brushy Mountain Bee Farm. I'm the general manager here. I'd like to welcome you all to a, uh, another webinar. This evening, as you know, we've got uh, Dr. Larry Connor with us. Uh, he has graciously agreed to, uh, to spend uh, a portion of his evening uh, speaking about uh, making splits and uh, increasing your colonies. Uh, Larry is, uh, is, is fairly well known in the, uh, the bee industry. He's published uh, a couple of books of which we, uh, we sell in our catalog. Uh, one which is very appropriate for, uh, for this evening's topic called Increase Essentials. He's also got uh, Bee Sex Essentials, which of course the title always uh, catches a lot of attention. And, uh, and he also has another one which is coming out uh, later on this, this year or uh, early next year, which uh, hopefully he'll, he'll mention here. Uh, this is an opportunity for him to shamelessly plug his, his work, uh, and, and I certainly encourage you to do that, Larry, given that, uh, that you're willing to take this time and, and meet with us. Uh, he's also written numerous articles for um, Bee Culture Magazine as, and also uh, American Bee Journal. He helps organize, actually not helps, but uh, really uh, does the organization of the Sideliner course at uh, American Beekeeping. Federation meeting which is held every January uh, as well as numerous other meetings across the country uh, one which isn't isn't too far off up in uh, in Connecticut the uh, the um, southern I always I always get the letters mixed up it's it's Sneva Southern New England beekeepers uh, assembly I believe it is yeah um, and so Larry I'd like to, to welcome you this evening um, and, and But before I turn it over to you completely, we've got a couple of poll questions that we'd just like to throw up uh, to people here so we can get a sense, in particular Larry can get a sense of, of sort of where people are in their beekeeping uh, experience and sort of help guide him a little bit in the, uh, the conversation this evening. So I'm going to throw up uh, the first poll question. If folks you could just take a, uh, a second here to respond to this. How long have you kept bees? And just uh, go ahead and, um, and start uh, answering there. I can see that we've got 39, 48%, 57, 69%, 75%. I feel like I'm at an auction here. Uh, over 80% uh, uh, voting. I'll go ahead and close this poll in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Last chance, last chance. All right, we'll close that poll. Let me uh, share the results with you. So we've got, uh, we've got uh, a fairly good spread here. Some of you haven't even uh, started bees yet, so you're uh, well on your way to getting some good information to help you in your beekeeping career. And then uh, it looks like uh, the next high, or the, the highest is first year beekeepers, Larry. So that ought to help you uh, sort of guide uh, the conversation this evening. Um, I've got, uh, I'm going to hide these results now. I'll just throw up the, uh, the second poll that I've got here, um, which is, uh, have you ever made a split or, uh, or an increase, uh, as we're sort of referring to them a little bit. So go ahead, if you would, uh, and, and respond to this. I've got uh, over 70, 80% responding in, almost 90%. I'll go ahead and close this poll in five, four, Three, two, one, and closing. Last chance. And let me share the results there with you. So uh, again, almost 50-50. 53% have made a, uh, a split or an increase, and, and 48 have not. So Larry, uh, that ought to give you some good insight uh, to the, the folks that are out there. And um, we'll, we'll go on for about uh, 45 minutes, and then I'll tr as we're going through, I'll try and filter through some of the questions that uh, we can uh, pose to Larry at the end of this. Larry, again, thank you very much for uh, spending time with us this evening, and it's all yours. Thank you, Shane. Appreciate being here this evening. Um, now, I just hope everybody realizes that you are in North Carolina, and I am in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Yeah, that's, that's right, yeah. Just people understand how this technology works because this is the first webinar I've ever done. So I have I have the usual butterflies about the first time technology issues. So uh, bear with me on this, but yeah, we'll survive. There's no problem there. 
I'm, uh, I'm ex I was excited about uh, talking about increased colonies and making them the sort, sort of thing that uh, that we're, our team is this evening because I think that one of the real challenges that we have is um, how do we function as beekeepers in this, I call it the post-CCD era where we've got uh, kind of a different emphasis on beekeeping in many different areas. Uh, this screen shows you my email address, ljconnor at aol.com, and just in case you're uh, in different parts of the country where Connor is often spelled with an E, R, uh, please note that. And also my website is wickwas.com, that's W-I-C-W-A-S, and the usual typo I get there is people put a K in the middle of it. So don't do that. Uh, this is a photo of me, I think last summer in one of the queen ring classes I uh, was conducting, and we'll talk a little bit about a little bit about queen ring. That's probably ahead of some of you, but not all of you. So the first question is, why do we want to make increased colonies? And uh, I think the easy answer is uh, basically bee beekeepers are, I won't say cheap, thrifty. And so they want to use the bees they've got. And how can you make more colonies with the colonies you've already got on hand? When is the time to do it, and how is the best way to do it? I'm changing the way I, I think about some of this, Shane. I'm thinking about new new beekeepers, first-year beekeepers should start mm -hmm. out with a five-frame nuke box. And the reason for that is that I'm finding that having that, that, that extra hive with an extra queen becomes a real asset for them. And uh, so uh, it's the way we want to look at the future in terms of the way we all keep our bees. The second thing is that, you know, I've been sort of... Uh, those of you that have read my articles, you know that I'm kind of down on package bees because some of the problems we have. Uh, one of the main in issues with, for me is the fact that these bees come out of Sunbelt states, southern states, western states, southwestern states, and they may or may not be appropriate for where some of you are. Now, I don't know where you are. I don't have a demographic of where the, you are located. You could be somewhere, in, anywhere in the world, right, Shane? Uh, yeah, actually, um, usually uh, we get a pretty good uh, geographic spread on uh, on folk from folks. Um, Larry, so uh, I'm sorry. I just want to introduce uh, Larry. I just want to um, uh, uh, interrupt you just one second as I'm scrolling through the questions. There have been a couple people that have just asked if you could speak just a little bit louder. Um, so I just wanted to make sure people weren't missing out on what you were saying. All right, let me lean up to the computer a little bit better. Is that better for folks? We'll give it a try. All right, so one of the things that's happening with a lot of beekeepers, regardless of where they are, is they want to have bees that are somewhat localized to their, their local area. Uh, some people call these survivor bees, survivor stock, um, localized bees. And by using nukes, you have an opportunity to, to expand that as well. And finally, I think that uh, if you produce nukes and you're successful at it, you can use the money to support your beekeeping habits. And I don't think anybody in here needs that further explained if you've been out chasing around bees. Well, of course, Mother Nature has her own way of making increase, and that's swarming. Here's a nice swarm from an old uh, image I had I found back in the, the 60s, I think. And... Uh, You've got to remember that swarming in this is an, an instinct. I uh, am always amazed by the number of articles I say, well, you want to select against swarming, but that's sort of like, you know, selecting a cow that doesn't move. Uh, so <laughs> it's in the nature of bees to swarm. And it is the way a colony reproduces itself. Most of you have probably heard this, this concept of a superorganism which a honeybee is, and a honeybee colony is, because a honeybee as an individual, as a queen, worker, or drone, cannot live by itself. It has to be part of that social unit. So this superorganism um, has to reproduce itself through swarming, and that's Mother Nature's way of, of producing new colonies of bees. Now, as beekeepers, we've got a whole bunch of terms that we use. Uh, we're talking about increased colonies today, but uh, we've already talked about uh, making up nukes, and you can see you've got nukes and nukes and nuking, 
Uh, other people call them splits, divides, set-offs down in the south, uh, central part of the, part of the country in Texas. They make set-offs. They don't make up increased colonies. But it's basically all the same concept of you taking some brood away from a, from a strong colony and making up a new colony with that. The word nucleus, nucleus actually was used by Langstroth. Uh, when Langstroth wrote uh, the original hive and honeybee, he used that word and it's a way of setting up a new colony by making a nucleus, a small hive, from a large hive. And so it's not a new concept, it's a fairly old one. We, as beekeepers, tend to be on the fence about whether or not we want swarms. We don't want our bees to swarm, but most of the experienced people in this group uh, that have had bees for a couple of years are probably chased out there and caught swarms. And I know some of the people listening have gone out and removed bees from sides of buildings. Well, that's another issue. But for our bees, we really don't want our bees to swarm if we can possibly help it. Uh, it's a fun thing to see when you're out there in the middle of the bee yard and the colony takes off. Like This is a beautiful day in May in Connecticut. You know, you walk through this mass of bees flying around you and nobody's stinging and they, they, they fly around in this like fish in a, in a school uh, sort of arrangement. It looks random, but they tell me it's not. And it's pretty exciting stuff, but you don't want your bees to do that. Uh, so swarms are a loss for you as a beekeeper. They're probably good for the environment, but a lot of the beekeepers I've spoken to this year, all their bees did this year was make swarms to repopulate the bee trees. Um, so anyway, so tonight what we want to do is we want to talk about ways that we can redirect this natural instinct and kind of use... Um, a couple of simple tools to to accomplish that. The first thing I like to do is have beekeepers, especially since we've got um, over half of you are in your first three years of beekeeping or haven't started bees. So what you want to think about doing is using nature's queen cells to make up new colonies. And there are two basic types of queen cells, swarm cells and supersedure cells. And they can appear uh, when the bees want them, not when you want them. And that's part of learning the process here so that you're able to, to do some of these things. Here's some uh, cells from a uh, Russian colony. Uh, this is a colony that has produced, I think that particular one probably produced a dozen to 18 swarm cells. And... Um, most beekeepers don't realize that the bees will actually keep the queens confined in those cells. And then you go in to work the colony, you disturb the bees that are keeping the queens in prison, if you will. Hmm. And so you'll find a dozen or more queens running around, which is one reason why you should always have empty queen cages in your pocket, in your bee veil, or somewhere close to your supply bucket, or if you're one of those people that's well organized, have some on hand, because you can pick up a whole bunch of really useful queens and use them. And virgin queens can be introduced just like any other queen. Uh, you just have to know how to do it. So during the swarming season, colonies are going to produce these swarm cells. Not every year. Uh, colonies will have some years they like to swarm, like this year, yeah, at least in the northern part of the country, although I think um, when I've been in California and uh, Texas and East Coast, we have people that have had a lot of swarms as well. The easiest way to do this is just to take a frame of uh, a brood out that has a sw the cell on it, or several cells, and put it into a new box. It's pretty straightforward. Or you can very carefully take a pocket knife and cut this a couple of cells out and use a toothpick or a paper clip or something to uh, hold them in. Not through the cell, but above the cell so that they still hang down in a natural arrangement. And by doing it that way, I think it, um, it can work out uh, fairly favorable for you as a beekeeper. More here than that. swarm cell. Just to make uh, swarm cells quite often when there's, there's a break in the comb. Uh, you might have had some uh, damage to a comb or they, they did a funny job of drawing it out and you'll see a cell on the face of the comb. 
Usually, though, when we see these uh, cells like this one, uh, we're, we're still keeping up with the images, right, Shane? Uh, as far as I know, yeah. I okay. see, I see I during, uh, sure. yep. During two procedure? During suit procedure, uh, there may be a few cells, okay, fewer cells. All right. There's, there's, a, there's a cell that people would probably call a suit procedure cell. And uh, it was in a colony here in, in my bees this summer that decided that they didn't like a brand new queen colony. So they had produced a suit procedure cell. And um, sometimes you'll have more than one of these so that you're able to use these as a way of making up an increased colony. Now, when a, a queen, a good queen, one that's lasted a couple of years even, is fading, uh, she's got a reduction in her egg laying rate, and uh, there's some new evidence that indicates that uh, the rate of egg laying determines the amount of pheromone she produces. Uh, when you get a drop in that queen pheromone that the queen's producing, then you've got the possibility of these supersedure cells. Now, they're both swarming in a supersedure. The queen lays the egg. There's some confusion. People think that the workers move eggs around. And that really doesn't happen. But the queen will lay into these cells. With supersedure, uh, they will usually use a queen cup that's already there. Certainly with swarming, they'll use a queen cup and the queen will lay into it. The bees then feed the queen the special diet, the royal jelly, throughout her entire development, and you get this, this cell that you see here. If I had a colony like this one, uh, we had one cell on one frame and another cell on another. So it sort of invites the opportunity for us to make an increase. Even though this happened in uh, July or August, uh, we still made up an increased colony, and by uh, the middle of September, the other option, of course, is to look at grafting some queen cells. And uh, this is something that um, probably the first two you don't want to get involved with, although I've noticed a lot of the uh, professional beekeepers will send their wives or kids to learn how to graft, and they've never done it before, and they do a fine job, which suggests to me that they'd be better off just learning to do it themselves to make they have bees. So here's some queen cells on a queen bar, and then there's some cups that didn't make it, and then queen cups that have, and the cells have been added onto that wax cup. These are called JZBZ cups, and these cells are nice and long. They're white because this took place during the major honey flow that happens in downtown Detroit every year. Uh, no one knew that, right? Now, <laughs> if you... If you can see the arrow uh, on this, you can see that there's a white area at the base of the uh, queen cups. And that is where the bees have filled those cells with royal jelly. When beekeepers ask me, how can you tell if you have a good, good queen uh, cell, I say do two things. First, hold the queen up to a really strong light and make sure there's something in that cell. Occasionally, the, the larvae or pupae will die. And uh, so it's an empty cell, and you don't want to take the time to use that. But the most important thing is to look at the amount of royal jelly that's in the base of that queen cell. And you can do that with these plastic cell bases. And a yeah, good queen cell has a surplus. The bees have provided more than enough food for that uh, larvae to feed on. So you've got a good queen, a well-fed queen, that, that results from this particular uh, operation. Another option, of course, is you can purchase queens. You can purchase queen cells. You can, in a few cases, you can even purchase Persian queens, unmated queens. Uh, and here are some mated queens that have come in. Uh, they're in a battery box. There's, uh, what, uh, five, eight, about 50 queens in there. And they're shipped with a pound or so of uh, nurse bees that have been shaken out of a colony, plus water. You add, plus, they usually add some protein supplements that have got some protein there as well. This is a good way of getting some early season queens. Uh, it may not fit into your program in terms of having localized stock, but if you're trying to make early colonies, uh, it's a way of doing it in, in a fairly effective way as far as I'm concerned. And uh, people who get into the business of making books for a living 
people out and do this so they can do it fairly early in their season, whatever that is, in your area. Uh, you can produce your own queens or virgins or make queens yourself with the grafting, and they're, that's probably the most typical technique that's used. Uh, I teach queen grain classes. Here's the shame. shameless, what is this? It's just a blatant plug. Uh, next year I've got two uh, classes that I've got scheduled for uh, my farm in, uh, in, in Galesburg, Michigan, which is near Kalamazoo. Uh, we had, uh, and even though I tried to cut it off at 20 people, we had about 31 uh, people show up last year, so I'm probably going to do two classes. That's great. And this was, this was a three-day class. I can do a one-day class. I've done that before. Um, there's a rumor afoot that I may be doing one of these classes in the Caribbean this, this winter. So uh, that hasn't come to, into hard copy yet, but if that happens, I'll be happy. <laughs> and people, some people will have a chance to go to the tropics in the winter. Now, if, they, if you live in the tropics, that's no big deal. But if you live in a, you know, like Ontario or Manitoba or Minnesota, that might sound like a good idea. Um, <laughs> And depending on your tax situation, might even be able to deduct it off of your income taxes if you're running a business. Um, so watch the journals on that one. The uh, point here is that if you just produce a, a dozen queens or so as a result of taking one of these classes, you probably paid for the training you've had. And whenever I teach a class, you learn a lot about biology. So you end up, I hope, being a better beekeeper least more knowledgeable, maybe not better in terms of out in the field. You know better. How's that? I like to use uh, three to five frame nukes in making increased colonies. These can be used for both mating and for uh, making up increase or just for making up increase. It depends on what you want to do. And of course there's, there are more and more people who now overwinter these nukes. So Spring, the late spring and early summer, depending on where they are. Now we're in Paris, Texas, and I won't mention the name of the, of the company this beekeeper is affiliated with, uh, but on the side, this particular beekeeper produces queens for its customers. These are all mating notes, and I don't recall whether they're three or four frame boxes. I believe they're all mediums, they're not deeps, but you know what, they all work. And the beekeeper is able to produce a couple of queens from each box, from each hive in the spring. And by the way, you notice they've got them up against a wind windbreak, which if you've ever been to North Texas, you realize in the spring you've got to have wind protection or you blow away, nothing planted to bees. <laughs> But if you look at close up here, you can see they've got different colors to help with orientation. This is a very simple box. And you notice the cover is simply a sheet of plywood with a hole drilled in it. And that provides a place for a feed jar. I don't recommend those feed jars in really cold places uh, because of the obvious temperature issues. But uh, even here in April or in May, you could use them uh, here in Michigan. Uh, earlier where you are, Shane, in North Carolina. But this is a way of producing some queens and, and, and then either leave them in that box for ease, get some queens out of there, and then produce some queens as they've got them. So here we're looking in that feed hole, and you see down at this lower, about 5 o'clock here, you see a wax cell, and that's a uh, queen cell that's been put into this box. And what had, what had happened here is the day before, the beekeeper had removed the mated queen, and then the next week had, had come out and placed a ripe queen cell into this mating box. So um, you didn't have to open the colony. All you had to do was take that to the feed can off and feed jar off and very gently put that cell in so it's facing or pointing downwards. And um, the bees, of course, go right over to it because they've been queenless now for part of the day. Another approach that uh, a number of people have been writing about, especially in the American Bee Journal, uh, Kirk Webster and Mark and uh, and uh, Mike Palmer are using double loops. And I wrote a lot of this in my book on increased essentials. 
uh, the double nukes, uh, the advantage here is you're just using standard beekeeping equipment, stuff you've already got, or uh, my suggestion is that every beekeeper, even if you're in your first or second year, you get some extra equipment on hand. That'll make you happy, Shane. Uh, <laughs> but have it available so you can, you, can, you can expand your operation when you want to do it. And you just have, when I say double nukes, there are two colonies in one 10 frame box. Looks something like this. Uh, again, this is a homemade uh, uh, bottom and cover. I'm not sure the cover is homemade or not, but you've got a a uh, piece of plywood at the bottom, and then a rim, and then a standard 10 frame box. You could use eight frames. I know you've got those there at uh, Brushy Brushy Mountain. So you could use uh, eight or 10 frame boxes. They could be deeps or they could be mediums. And you could use these for moving if you're increased colonies. And the side view, you see that they've got a side entrance rather than the front en front entrance. So you've got a, a solid bottom that's nailed right into the box, and then they've just routed out a little entrance hole. You could just use a uh, chisel and uh, support to make it cool these. And then the scoping inner cover. But what's this this white thing here that's hanging out? Well, that's that's a piece of high technology. That's a that's a recycled feed bag. <laughs> uh, that's a plastic woven material, and it acts like an inner cover, but it's also it serves as the inner cover, but it actually acts like a little wick. So it, it, during the winter, it gets some extra moisture out. So this colony you see here, this this photo you see right here, let me just uh, make it bigger. See if this works on live. Let's say live TV. What are we doing here? Live, live webinar? Live webinar. And, uh, live webinar. Here we go. And so you can see there's the queen uh, cell, JZBC queen cell that they use. Here's the uh, plastic material that uh, they're using from the feed bag. And you see that there's, there's chocolates on there, so that's acting as a uh, inner cup. And so you, this one actually has four frames in it. You can't see the fourth frame. Then there's a divider uh, that completely divides the two units, and that plastic helps keep them separate. And then you've got another colony with the entrance on the other side. This worked out really well as far as a system of uh, low cost increase. And uh, this system was developed uh, uh, in uh, Vermont, and they were one of these units. We'll talk more about that later. Let's, let's just talk a minute about numbers. If you set up a, a four-frame unit like this with a couple of frames of brood and a frame of food, food being honey and pollen, and an empty frame, you might start out the middle of April if you're in the northern areas. This would be uh, earlier in the south, and you know, let's flip this over if you're in the southern hemisphere. So you've got a, a fairly low number of bees when you set this up, under 5,000 bees. But because you're using frames of sealed emerging brood, that number will go up very nicely. Now, depending on what kind of queen you put in there, then you'll probably have a little dip in the population at some point because those older bees are going to be dying off and the the new brood has not emerged yet. But when that new brood starts to emerge, so on this particular model, we're looking at somewhere around the middle of May. You can see that by the 1st of June, we're up to around 19, 20,000. And by the end of uh, June, we're up to 35,000 bees. Now, that's a pretty sub substantial colony. And you can see how uh, a colony like this, made up with a couple of frames of brood and the bees on that, and food, can be fairly productive if you uh, if you do a few basic things. And things are uh, don't do anything to interfere with these bees and feed them. You got to feed these bees if you want to do their job. So you could make up nukes with three frames or four frames or five frames or eight frames or ten frames or well, somebody just said they had a seven frame box. Okay, whatever you've got, you can split them or you can use them whole. They can be deep or they can be medium uh, depth frames. There are no real rules on this. And whatever you have available to you that you want to use 
now feel free to use it. Uh, I, th I think that's something that we should encourage beekeepers to do, even brand new beekeepers, so you've got an idea of what's going on. Uh, <clears throat> so as I suggested before, keep a couple of empty high boxes, uh, maybe set some of these up in anticipation that your bees may produce swarm cells or do some of the other things that would indicate you've got uh, an opportunity to make some increase. You also have the possibility of just catching the form and putting them in one of these boxes too. Now this uh, last story I was down in Dave Mix's operation in Florida. He's a, a commercial queen producer and uh, produces uh, hundreds of thousands of queen cells every year for use by beekeepers. And he uses what's called a three-way. And so this is an overwinter nuke. This was early February. And they're actually pulling brood out of some of these boxes because they're so strong. So they're keeping them fairly uh, uh, trimmed down so that they will make queens there. But you can actually use nukes as a source of brood if you need to do that or if you want to do that, depending on what you're doing with the rest of your beekeeping operation. Well, if you're going to set up uh, increased colonies or nukes, you want to make sure you know where the queen is. And if you're a new beekeeper, you probably have a certain amount of anxiety about finding the queen. Uh, I think that's the one thing I have students this year that said, you know, I still have not seen the queen in that colony. But we know she's there because of the eggs and larvae. You can uh, go into a nice strong colony that may be on the verge of swarming and remove some of those swarm cells with the brood that's on there and carefully move the, the uh, frames looking for the queen. If you miss her, the queen may end up in one of your nuke boxes rather than staying behind in that original colony. Well, you can always switch things around later if you need to. But it's a good idea if you're going to find the queen, and that's one reason I like to have my queens all, all pretty and painted. And in terms of working a colony, here it takes two beekeepers to work one hive. Uh, we're going to work from the outside frame on one side all the way across. So I call the outside frame on one side frame number one, and you go all the way across to the other side. So if you've got ten frames, to frame number ten, you've got eight frames to frame number eight. And you're going to inspect, you're going to look at both sides from the queen, and I leave the frames out until I find the queen. And if you've got a good strong colony in the spring, uh, from Florida to Michigan, I've seen about 10 to maybe 15 percent of the spring colonies will have more than one queen present. So you have to keep your, your eyes open for uh, probably the daughter, mother-daughter combinations that they tolerate each other. The, um, the mother-daughter combinations don't fight the way the sister queens do. So here's a nice uh, big queen with uh, a big green dot on her. Uh, uh, thorax so we can spot her it quickly and uh, I like to, to do that and I tell beekeepers they need to go out and practice marking and even clipping but do it on drones first so that they don't uh, have any problems. Yeah, it can be kind of hard even with a, a drop of paint on the back of the thorax of the queen. Uh, it's sometimes hard to see a queen so the paint helps. You're now going to go and pick out two or three frames of brood, and you're in charge of how much brood the frame. A frame like this looks pretty good. This was in April, and so uh, that's about as good as they get in Michigan in April. Come May, it might be corner to corner with uh, brood, and this is the brood here in this area, and this uh, you know half moon shape, and this area in the corner, and down here is honey, and then in between you'd expect you to see a band of pollen and some eggs and larvae there as well. I like to just stack up the uh, frames I'm going to take out. Obviously, I'm not going to use all of these. I'm sorting through to take out the, the, the biggest ones. But I've taken five, six frames out of one colony because it was booming. And uh, so the parent colony can donate quite a bit of this. Your objective here for the parent colony is you want to stop any swarming instinct. 
And then the bees and the brood that you take out without the queen, of course, it can be used to make up those that, that increase that you're after. Uh, another approach that um, a number of commercial uh, beekeepers are using, and I remember reading a scientific article about this back in the 1960s. You just take a full-size colony, and you decide that I'm going to split this colony up. And you might make four or five or six colonies, increased colonies, from one colony. When you get done, there's nothing left. You ever done that, Shane? Um, I usually don't go get that, that extreme. All right. Well, it is extreme. But then you just put the new boxes in a circle around the old entrance. The old hive's gone. You, you take that equipment away, and you might have four nuke boxes all facing, and then the field force comes back, and in theory they redistribute themselves equally. Well, they probably won't, but you can switch two or three of those to equalize the strength of the hives. And I think it's a pretty clever technique. And now you've got you know, four to six colonies where you only had one. Okay, you won't make any honey this year, but <laughs> if it's past the honey flow, if you're down in... Uh, North Carolina and his past tulip. Uh, what do you get after tulip? <laughs> oh, you get. Uh, we oh. didn't get anything this year. We barely got tulip this this year. Sounds like Michigan. <laughs> now, one of the things that beekeepers will say, "Well, I'm just going to let the bees raise their own queen." Well, fine, good. Uh, if you do that, you need to have brood that looks about that small, and. Uh, let me do this enlargement thing again if I can, because what you're looking at, it's, it's fighting with me. There we go. You want to you wanna have larvae, so you've got eggs up here in this corner, a couple of eggs. And then uh, here's some larvae. And they're floating on a bed of royal jelly. That's what the, the bees are going to use for... Uh, for making a new queen. They're going to pick those larvae out. Uh, you can't tell as a beekeeper. You won't be able to know which one they're going to pick out. But the bees will do that for it, and they'll start making queen cells out of it. So do you want to let the bees do that, or do you want to control the situation? So we're going to have a little beekeeper's math test. You don't have to take out pencil and paper, unless you yeah. want to write this down. You didn't tell me there was going to be a test. Did you take a, a newly? No, no, no. I say this is this is not a test. Oh, it's not a test. But okay. They can write this information down. These, these are the answers. Okay. All right. If you if you install a brand new queen, a mated queen that's been taken out of a a mated nuke yesterday, and put her into your colony today, <coughs> you'd expect her to be have her laying eggs in anywhere from one to five days, depending on how quickly they, the bees get that, uh, that queen out of there. So that's pretty fast. If you happen to use a queen that you've ordered from uh, Joe's uh, Queen Breeding and Storm Bear Company in uh, Swickley, Pennsylvania, actually, I only pick on Swickley because I, it's a long story I won't get into. But anyway, <laughs> and the queen has been in a queen bank. You know where Swickley is? It's uh, near Beaver. Now everybody's going to say, I know where Beaver is. All right. Now, if you have a mated queen, but she's been banked, it takes several days for her ovaries to swell up again. So it's going to be hard for her to uh, yeah, produce as fast. Even though she's mated, she's going to be delayed in her production. Now, you can use virgin queens. And so if you buy... Uh, Queens that have, have been emerged and caged, and they're about seven days old, it's going to take them si somewhere between five and ten days to mate and start laying. I think you probably ought to figure out ten days as a, as a general rule. You can use a ripe queen cell, and up here you can see a cell that's being put into a, a, one of uh, Dave Mix's colonies down in Florida. And here's the, the JZBZ cell, and they're just putting it in between the frames, hanging it down uh, right at the top of the hive. And there'll be, uh, there's three frames there and that three-frame nuke. Those uh, queen cells are going to take between 12 to 
if they're really ready, really ripe, or ready to hatch right away, to about 17 days before you have the queen emerged, uh, mated, and laying. Each step is a that's another a hurdle that the queen has to get over. Now, something that's fairly new out of Europe is the use of 48-hour queen cells. And here are some queen cells that are two days past grafting. So these bees are actually, what, five days old? The, see, three days is a larvae, two days is a, uh, three days is an egg, three days is an egg, two days is a larvae. And you can see the bees have added uh, a lot of uh, wax on there, and there's already a lot of royal jelly. Well, I want to try that. We'll show pictures of that later, what we did this summer, uh, and, and how well that works. But it looks like it's a possibility. But it's going to take you uh, between two, excuse me, between three and two and three weeks before that queen is produced and is out and uh, laying eggs. And finally, to answer the question, should you let bees produce their own queen? If you've got a tail larvae, like I showed you before, it's going to take between four and four and a half weeks for that larvae to be turned into a queen, the queen to develop, emerge, mate, and start to lay. So that's the cost of using, uh, letting the bees raise their own queen compared to, you know, four to 10 days for the mated queen from a queen bank for five to 10 days for a virgin queen. So Larry, you keep that in mind when you're, when you're uh, doing some of these. Yeah. I'd like to just uh, interject a bit here because we actually have a question about this, you know, letting the bees raise out their own, their own queen. And it's regarding yep. uh, the mate. There's also the, the mating quality that you have to consider here if you're letting, uh, I guess, any the the last four options there the virgin queen the ripe queen cell the 48 hour and the larvae and and also too um, um, it was actually at Sneba about two years ago maybe I guess it was two years ago when Dave Tarpy who will be with us next week in a webinar um, was talking about the 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 bees using uh, or raising out emergency queen cells and about the quality of those queens, um, because the, the bees will select any larvae that's appropriate age. Well, they select the three-day-old larvae, which they can still just get a bear, you know, still within that window to get a queen. But he found that they found they were tended to be inferior queens, but yet they were also the first to emerge out, killing off all the other cells. So there's also that to consider too, and, and I'm sorry if your, your next slide probably addresses that very point, but I, you know, I saw the question here, and I just wanted to sort of throw that in there. You know, that's why I put this question in because a lot of people, you know, they say, well, the easy way to do it is just to let them raise their own queen, uh, and there's some really big names in uh, the history of beekeeping, uh, very successful beekeepers who practice that. And uh, you know you you assume that if you a business a person's been in business for 40, 50 years that they've they've been going to the bank with deposits and not withdrawals during that time period, uh, so they must be successful. Uh, so you know it's sort of a bottom line beekeeping. The question I have though is, will that queen that's been let's say better better reared, she's she's in better shape. Uh, she's a younger queen. Will she produce a colony that produces more honey or is uh, more productive in other ways that you're looking for, maybe for pollination? So that's another issue. Uh, and, and quite frankly, a lot of beekeepers just don't know enough to be able to tell the difference. And I hate to say that. But I think it's true. A lot of a lot of people just kind of take it, whatever they can get, and they're happy with it. Now, if you're in a southern area, California, Texas, Florida, even Georgia, uh, all the southern tier states, you might think about having year-round nukes. Uh, these would be probably uh, four or five frame boxes. You might be able to do three well, like uh, in Mexico. But it's a possibility that you can keep these queens going, and you've always got some on hand. But for most of us, I suspect in this group that uh, we're talking to today, we need to think about ways that we can produce nukes to either make up new colonies of bees this year or next year. And uh, you don't want to make up nuke boxes until the bees are making 
a profit in terms of honey production. Uh, at least breaking even, they're not uh, using up reserves. That probably means that here in Michigan, I'm not going to try to do this on a good year in early uh, April, in, in early, late April, early May, and this year, late May, early June, because the season was so darn uh, retarded. Uh, the weather was retarded, not the beekeeper. Uh, and so by using four or five frame nukes and uh, a new queen, you can build these colonies up the summer and overwinter them. And that's something that uh, uh, people do. And they say, well, why would you want to do that? And, and my answer gets back to the point I made at first is, you know, because we're cheap. Oh, I just said we're beekeepers, aren't cheap? Uh, we're being thrifty. Because if each one of these boxes has uh, uh, the potential of becoming a new colony next year, that by the 1st of May it will be filling up 10, 10 frames, and by the 1st of June it will be in uh, a second deep and maybe even in, in the super with honey, uh, that really speaks loudly to me. Now here's Mike Palmer in northern Vermont, and he's got uh, a scheme where he overwinters his colonies full, full size. Uh, he overwinters these double nukes over a 10 frame equipment. So that's a, each of these colonies that he's got here has three deep hive bodies. It takes about 90 pounds of food for his bees to survive the winter. And he's got two nukes on top of each of these colonies. So that's his way of wintering. And the final wrap looks like this. You've got a lower entrance for the big colony and upper entrance for the big colony. So that's all one colony there. The nuke entrances are over here. Now they're separated just by the bottom board of that nuke. So there's no screen or anything there. And but what happens is that these bees, in this, especially late winter, they create a thermal cluster because, you know, when it's 20 below zero, any heat that's coming from this large colony is going to go up and warm this, the two smaller colonies up here. So that thermal cluster becomes really important. And if you've got good mite control, they'll all survive, but during the early years, the big colonies died and the nukes survived which was probably one of the motivations that I had for writing this book on increased essentials, which you can get through Shane um, or through my website. Um, this book has been kind of surprising to me because it's been so popular. Not that that's a bad thing, but you never know what's going to happen when you do a book. And the whole idea comes back to bite you in funny ways. Here's a bee yard in the city of San Francisco. And those are all affectionately referred to as Larry Connors nukes. <laughs> because the idea came from the book. Well, the, my ideas are not my ideas. They're ideas I've picked up from other people. You can actually see the cloud bank over the water there in the far distance. But here's a, a, a drought-stricken garden in San Francisco. And these are all nuke boxes. So these are all colonies that have been used and split there. And... Uh, What's that? That's what's the name of that? Uh, the one out of Ontario. Anyway, they you've got all kinds of different things going on. A hobby operation, uh, a small lot, and filled with new boxes. So you can keep these. You can make it anywhere. Here's another, you know, increase in the city. Sorry, uh, two two <laughs> two beekeepers, each had a colony, and now they have six because they read my book. So they've been making splits, and uh, so each of these are our daughter colonies. There's a parent, there's another parent, and then two daughter colonies. Uh, I, I love the fact because now you've got uh, four So anyway, you've got, a, you've got a nice bee yard with a view. You're looking out over the San Francisco Valley. You've got a pot of flowers here. And um, what's interesting is a couple of one thing else is the more urban 
uh, they go to Detroit, there's a big in Chicago, they're keeping bees. And uh, I call them gorilla beekeepers because sometimes they're eagles and sometimes they are. But my point is, and I had to inspect these colonies, that from two colonies they ended up with six. And these are all first or second year beekeepers. So it's not something that um, I can't do. I think we need to encourage people to try it. I just want to note here this little windbreak, windbreak just out of what's that pipe and, and some burlap. Pretty clever. So uh, I think this is the, the trend for a lot of beekeepers. If you're going to keep bees in the city or anywhere, you've got to know your climate. San Francisco, of course, is known for its cool summers and warm falls. So they need to know what's going in there. And this is red gum, the pink version of the red gum, which is a eucalyptus. And even though it's a marginal area for beekeeping, the bees can get uh, quite a bit of food from some of these things. So know your plants, know your weather, know your climate when you when you make up nukes. And, and map it out on paper or a calendar so you know what's going on. I've reprinted two books by uh, GM Doolittle. Doolittle lived over 100 years ago. And some science is primarily about queen ring, as you expect, but he's got a lot of basic beekeeping information in his book. And uh, I've been real pleased with the response to that one. I've also been pleased with the response to the other book he wrote later in his life about uh, keeping bees in an out apiary. And he talks about things about how do you make up a new colony of bees without another yard to move bees away. You know, that is that uh, you have to move bees every more than two miles. Well, in this book he talks about making up increased colonies right, right within the same bee yard. So there, it's pretty simple. He just puts uh, raise the brood of over a scooter. So he has nothing but nurse bees in there to, to set up the new hive. Then you can set them off as a little dog. Now this is the new book. This is going to print uh, either tomorrow or Monday and uh, Queen Ring Essentials and uh, uh, about 100 pages, 160 some color photographs is just, just crammed with all kinds of information. Not necessarily what we're talking about tonight, but you can't you can't pass up a plug, right? Nothing wrong so, with a shameless plug. Kind of rind, winding, uh, kind of winding down, one of the things that, uh, I have a series of comments here. One is that um, with the making up of nukes, we found that there seems to be an increase in the amount of chalk brood with smaller colonies. And chalk brood is generally associated with cool, damp weather. And I think maybe we can add to that uh, weaker colonies. So if you make up a nuke in the cool, damp weather, make sure they're, they have a good uh, bee population. Uh, the chalk brood, you can see it really well in these down here at this corner. They look like they're, they're tan and white. Sometimes they turn black. And this year I had chalk brood in some colonies that are supposedly disease resistant. Ha. Uh, and they probably were running 80% of the cells with chalk brood. So not a happy event. Now here are some nukes. This was actually back at that Paris, Texas operation. But these were nukes that came in by truck sold. And there is a very strong market for locally produced nuke boxes. So uh, are, you know, filled with bees. So it's not something you wanted to ignore. I mentioned the 48-hour queen cells in uh, uh, Toulouse, France. John, Dr. John Kiefus showed me this setup. Uh, this is just a, a dry run without uh, larvae in there. And these are some of the JCBC cell cups. They're shipping these all over France. And they're using a call that looks like this. This is a 48-hour Cell, an old cell. This is a cell that was grafted two days ago. And notice that they're already filled with royal jelly. And John Kiefus argues that the reason they picked this is they, they've finished most of the feeding, but the larvae is still small enough that it can't wiggle out to get a larger queen larvae. And they just they ship these things overnight, and they seem to do very well. And uh, uh, I'm not sure too sure what kind of abuse they get, but uh, I tried a few this uh, year, and um, 
here's a queen cell put into a nuke, and uh, they drew it out very nicely, and it just huh. filled with royal jelly. So, I uh, it's certainly something I'm going to be looking at more, and I'm uh, kind of encouraged that because you know the the investment time wise in queen rearing, yeah, you know, you've got two or three days here of of work on your part, and you've got something that you can use in your nuke. So it's something to look at. One of the other things that's, that's come out of the nuke production is the fact that nukes offer a level of varroa mite control. And here's a poor drone uh, pupae that's got one, two, three uh, hardened uh, varroa mites, and at least one or two more that have not uh, darkened yet. And by creating nukes, you create a break in the brood cycle. And that seems to be very critical in terms of reducing nukes. Uh, the, the mite level in these my observation a lot of years has been that uh, people who make up these increased colonies that maybe uh, tie it in with something fairly basic like the, the powdered sugar dusting with screen bottom boards, they end up with the colonies they don't have to treat. And uh, that makes a, a lot of sense to me. Now this is down in Louisiana. This is actually the the Russian uh, mating yard that uh, this is one of the used to photos. But if you look at making up nukes, so there's I think groups of four nukes down the the bayou. I'm not sure they're still there anymore. But uh, you know it's possible that even a colony, a beekeeper with uh, ten colonies or twenty colonies, could be producing extra nukes every year and selling several of them. And as I said, you got to support that beekeeping habit somehow. Well, like all things in life, you've got to be patient as you learn. No response. Okay. <laughs> and uh, we're talking about the mating. We're talking about the mating. Uh, you've got to, uh, you do have to have a plan for drone production. <laughs> and uh, here's, uh, you saw the, the Pirco drone comb there? Yeah. Uh, Shane? Yes. Yeah. I recommend it, and uh, the, uh, I put it, this is, the, this is what I call a number three position, which is usually on a full-size colony. This is right at the edge of the brood nest. And so we want the drones on the outside there where they are instinctively placed in nature, even in wild bee trees. And people have used uh, these as a way of putting them in the freezer and then putting them back in or scraping the drones off there because it's that plastic midrib. You can just use a putty knife. Now, what I do is, you know, for queen rearing class, what I teach people is to take these out, put them into nukes, and then use powdered sugar as the drones emerge, the worker bees emerge. Of course, you've got to move worker brood uh, with it as well. So it gives you a way of... Uh, controlling the varroa mites and uh, having drones for mating. So it's the, uh, the, uh, the bee sex aversion of having your cake and eating it too. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is what you're supposed to show. Oh, bee sex. Yeah, here's, here's the original bee sex cover. This is not the uh, final version that I... I was too lazy to look for the final version today, even though it's sitting here on the bookshelf. I didn't want to take another picture. Uh, that was supposed to be the original cover photograph, but we switched it at the last minute because of uh, some technical glitch. But the big thing that I make in the B-Sex uh, book that I like beekeepers to remember is this. Here's a dissection by uh, uh, Anita Collins, this technician when she was at USDA in Beltsville. Here's a laying queen. And you see these two large ovaries that are filled with about a total of about 370 ovarioles. And there's a lateral oviduct here, a lateral, lateral oviduct, and a median oviduct. There's an egg in there. And here's the sperm theca. That's the sperm storage sac. And as the eggs pass through this, they release some sperm and they get fertilized. So keep that in mind, and I'll show you the next picture of a queen, a laying queen, just like this, has been put into a queen bank and stored for some time. Her ovaries shrink up. Now, she still can lay viable eggs. 
But my, my point in showing this is that cranking can be de uh, detrimental. And I'm afraid if this queen is released very quickly, um, it should be killed. And uh, I, which is why if I were a beekeeper buying queens from somebody, I'd say, have these queens been banked? And if so, how long? And then if they have been, that doesn't mean they're bad. That means you've got to re delay their release for at least five days, maybe seven days before the bees can get out. So that wraps up what I had to say. I don't know how we're doing on time, Shane. Uh, we're a little past seven. So we're doing all right. Oh. Now, I just had to say that the Connor family has been making increase, too. Look this at my that. my born two weeks ago. Look at He's that. Sweetheart, so. Congratulations. So, uh, so, you know, we've my daughter's 37, so we've only been waiting a while. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I'm going up to Alaska to see her in a couple of weeks, so that'll be fun. So get out there and have fun with your camera. Take pictures, please. And you can increase. And there's my address We're on the internet, which is usually the best way to get a hold of me. And uh, all right, any questions? We do. We do have uh, some questions, and I've got some too. Um, and and I've got uh, one that uh, I'd like to start off with. You know, we we saw at the very onset that a lot of the folks listening in this evening are relatively new to uh, to beekeeping. And so the prospects, the idea of raising queens is, is that much more daunting than just simply beekeeping. Um, Larry, we went over a couple of different methods uh, this evening. What would you say uh, would be the simplest, uh, easiest way uh, for someone that doesn't have a whole, years of experience of beekeeping under their belt uh, what, what method would you recommend for someone to start raising queens? Well, I, I, I'll go back to what I said about using nature's queen. Use the queen cells that the Mother Nature gives you. So that if you're keeping bees here in Michigan and you've got swarm cells at the end of May, that's time to, to make up nukes. You don't have to raise queens. The bees have already done it for you. Um, okay. If you don't have a year that the bees are producing these swarm cells. And by the way, some people say, oh, you should never use a swarm cell. And, uh, you know, and I made the comment about that's like having to never move. It's an instinct. It's part of the behavior to make, make uh, swarms. So they're going to eventually do it. You probably have seen a selection towards swarming since varroa mites have uh, appeared because the colonies have sworn more probably have some natural defense against the raw mites. Why? That thing about the break in the brood nest. No, that's a sidebar. Going back to your question, Shane, I would use nature's queens. The second option is that I wouldn't try to raise queens the first year or two. I would go to somebody, a neighbor. If you're in a bee club, you've got, you've got a, a lot of bee clubs out there, and find somebody who's raised Queens, and uh, I've discovered that uh, experienced beekeepers, so that 23% that was over five years of beekeeping, they can be ranking these queen cells and, and have a nice little side business, even raising those 48-hour cells. Use those. If you can do virgins, that's probably better. But, you know, make a network of uh, connections with your local beekeepers. And if you're going to do that, I'm going to make a request. Let's use some varroa resistant stock that's been tested and been shown that's resistant to varroa mites and stop propagating things that are susceptible uh, to mites. And we'd be better off to be industry. All right, next. Um, I was wondering, uh, you were talking about trying to find the queen uh, in the colony. I was wondering what you thought about using a queen excluder between brood chambers um, to and, and leave it there for uh, at least three days so that uh, if she's in the top chamber, all the eggs in the bottom one will have hatched, and when you go back through, at least you can narrow your search down. What do you think about that? I think it's a great idea, and I never do it because I never think about it in advance. Okay. But I mean, you don't see any harm yeah, it's in it. like everything else. I wish I could have done that three days ago, four days ago. Um, for... Um, 
one of the things that I mentioned the little blocks for was because he would he would simply take a colony of bees that's in two deeps or two mediums, doesn't make any difference what, and put the coin excluder on the first box and then shake all the bees off right at the entrance. Just thunk them on the ground. We're used to the top bar, thunk them on the ground. You don't get every bee. That's not the point. But if the queen's there, she's going to go into the box. The bees are going to go in the box. But if you've got brood up out there, and you, you use the uh, open brood, then the bees are going to crawl through the queen excluder, but the queen won't. And now you've got a, a, a group of bees that have no queen, and that's how you can make up increase. And you can set that off into your uh, the same bee yard there in San Francisco or uh, uh, Paris, Texas, wherever you are, and you don't have to worry about bees all drifting back because the only bees you're moving are nurse bees. Now, one thing I do warn people about is they need to reduce the entrance because you might get a robbing problem. And, and I mean, that's, that's, stick with it. that's here's a system that's been around in the in the books for over a hundred years. And nobody talks about it. And, and Larry, you've just made a a, a perfect segue to the to a question that was asked by William in uh, New Hampshire who says that um, how do you defend against robbing? Um, uh, he's got some nukes apparently. Uh, they're too small to defend themselves. Um, uh, you can't seal them up completely. The entrances are, are reduced as much as possible, but robbing still has been really bad apparently in New Hampshire this fall. So, so do you have any tips to help protect uh, a weak nuke against uh, excessive robbing? Yeah, I've got two suggestions. Um, uh, I have the same problem here at my bee yard at the farm, and um, we have class uh, members that have their students out there, and it's pretty uh, pretty frustrating when you you work in bees and you look down and you see more yellow jackets than you do uh, honeybees, um, and of course that's just the the non apis robbers. Then you've got the colonies that are robbing each other out. I think that. Um, for small nukes, they go to. They need to look up uh, the technique developed by Harry Laidlaw back in the 50s or 60s. It's in his book on queen rearing that I sell, but it's called a robbing screen, and all it is is a it's a, a decoy entrance. So you have a little wooden rim with a window screen on it, and so the odor of the hive in the normal flight pattern has a window screen over it. And then you have a hole for the entrance that's just one bead wide. Just one bead can get in and out at a time. And for a weak nuke, that's the way to do it. And uh, it's hard for those robber bees to find it because they're attracted to the odor of the uh, hive. And it's going to take them a while to find the entrance. And then when they find it, they probably won't be welcomed in. All right. Uh, how do you uh, get enough food into a nuke box that uh, will provide the, that colony with enough uh, resources to make it through winter? We started feeding the 15th of August, and we're still feeding. So that's the key right there is just keep feeding the, those yeah, nukes. And, and, uh, yeah, and, and, we've been feeding, and we've been feeding both the uh, Mega B diet, not that I'm big on Mega B, but that's what I, I pick up sometimes. I've used uh, some of your competitors' products too, uh, Shane. Hate to admit it, but uh, when I'm eating, I pick up both there, and uh, I don't have any preference one way or the other. Uh, my wallet does sometimes. But <laughs> the uh, the big thing is to keep that sugar syrup going in, and uh, we've tried a variety of things with new beekeepers this year on sugar syrup feeding. And I hate to tell you, I've had some problems with my students and the the top feeders. Um, so I've gone back to some of the division board feeders, and uh, we've got sponges, uh, pieces of uh, natural sponge that we put in there so the bees can float out on them. Hmm. And that seems to work, even though it's, you know, feeders are locked up inside and so forth. You don't want to lose a lot of bees. But uh, earlier this month and all of last month, they were emptying those uh, one-gallon feeders. Some of them, those nukes were emptying them in two days. That's wow. how much food they need. So we want to have those five-frame nukes 
with four and a half frames of food and about a half a frame of cluster space. So no matter what size you've got there, you want to have a really dense uh, food supply. And the reason we're feeding the protein, just as a sidebar here, as if you've heard anything about fat bees, skinny bees, I'm not talking about myself, I'm talking about the bees now. Uh, we want to have a lot of fat bees that are nutritionally well fed going into winter. And uh, my editor, Kim Flottam, I think you've had him on this series. Sure. Uh, Kim talks about feeding the, feeding the bees to feed the bees that go through the winter. So you've got to have healthy bees producing the bees that are they're going to go through the winter. And that is really important. So that's why we start in August, even though we've got natural food coming in, because we might have a, a wet, uh, damp period for three or four days, and I want those bees to keep eating rather than start, start destroying uh, eggs and larvae. When you look at some of the literature, uh, you see that uh, after summer solstice, uh, in June, bees become much fussier about the brood they keep on board. And by the time you reach August, they might be throwing out 20% of the eggs and larvae that the queen produces because conditions aren't that good. Now, if you're in the middle of the nectar flow, you know, you're lucky. But uh, this year has been a pretty miserable year in most of the Midwest. And I'm afraid that a lot of people are probably in the same boat where they are. So feeding is the absolute necessity. Now, back in the dark ages, when I worked with the Day Dance and uh, Harvey York with the bee breeding program called Genetic Systems, I talked to Harvey York about feeding bees. And he made a, a, a point that I want to repeat because it's one that sticks with me, and I, I think it's very important. So when you feed sugar syrup, you don't lose that. That's either turned into bees or it's stored. And there's somehow a mythology amongst some beekeepers that if you feed bees, you make them lazy. Well, that's sort of like the, the cow and the moo. Uh, <laughs> the instinct of the bee is, is to hoard, to hoard food. There's some really great studies on hoarding behavior. And I'd like to see everybody you know, try to, to learn more about that. It is in the nature of the colony to hoard as much food as they can. And if you give them three days of hoarding when Mother Nature doesn't provide food for them, your colony is better off. We, we've got a couple of questions uh, that are along the same lines of feeding, and, and we can elaborate on this a little bit more. Um, is, it, is it ever too cold uh, to feed during winter, or should you ever stop feeding? Um, We've got some people up north where they're getting snow right now. You getting snow up there, Larry? See, Andy, quite, yeah, we had snow this morning. <laughs> Quakes. And we're supposed to have some tonight. Not, not to stick, but, you know, we still have leaves on our trees up here. This is, this is way too early. We're about 10 to 15 degrees below average temperatures right now. We got up into the 40s today. We should be up in the, in the 60s. Anyway, enough of my complaining. Uh, what temperature do you stop feeding? Well, I wish I had a good answer because, you know, I'm, uh, I had a discussion with my younger brother who kept bees back uh, in the 70s, and he said, oh, you stopped feeding October 1st in Michigan. And, you know, as one who's been feeding since October 1st, what happens is, remember, individual bees are cold-blooded. The colony's warm-blooded, if you want to think about it in terms of a, a superorganism. But the individual bees... They get chilled, so they're going to take down less food when it's 43 degrees out than they will at 63. So their, their feeding rate is going to be diminished. Second, they're not going to be able to process that sugar syrup. We're feeding a thick syrup, two parts of sugar to one part of water. And uh, it's going to, they still need to process that into a honey-like product. So they have to do the inversion uh, that's, that goes on with honey. So at some point fairly soon, we probably will go to using a honey candy or a fondant. And a number of uh, uh, people here in Michigan, and, and Kim Flottam and others, uh, they have gone to uh, uh, using a, uh, a mixture that's used for making frosting. And, it, and it's basically 
uh, sugar and probably a little corn syrup. There are recipes on, uh, online you can get. I don't know if you've got them there, uh, Shane, or not. And it's a mixture of, of uh, sugar and a little corn syrup. Sometimes they put some uh, uh, a little water and some other things, depending on the recipe. You make this up and you make a, a solid cake of this and you put it on your hive. Now, I've always used this as a late winter spring feed, but I think, well, why not just leave it on all winter? And I think a number of beekeepers are doing that. And they, they actually make a little feeder rim, an uh, inch and a half, two inches deep, with this uh, fondant on there. And it sits right on top of the frames, and they might use a, uh, uh, an inner cover on top of that and top insulation or something. But from what I can see, uh, we're very rapidly approaching the point where the bees are going to have trouble removing the moisture and uh, getting the uh, honey, that sugar syrup, even though it's a heavy syrup, converted. And then, of course, very soon, probably with, by, by Thanksgiving here in Michigan, uh, we run the risk of those jars breaking, So unless you're using plastic jars. So it's time to, to pull them off and go to the honey candy and uh, having that as an insurance policy. Now, if the colony is starving to death right now, uh, you've got a big problem. And uh, I can't apologize for it. You've probably already lost the colony. If, they're, if they don't have the reserve uh, food, uh, you probably have already lost them when the bees are still alive. What would I do if I had another colony that's fairly strong? I'd combine those bees, uh, newspaper method, or powder sugar them all, and then combine them. And um, and see what happens there. Um, answer that question. Yeah, actually, we've we've got uh, we've got one person here. It's it's sort of it's it's sort of interesting the way these questions come in. Is it a good idea to feed uh, granulated sugar on top of newspaper that is laid across the top bars? The very next person posts on dried sugar on newspaper works great. So <laughs> I don't know if these two people are in cahoots with one another and sort of posing and answering their own questions, but it's sort of ironic that uh, they came in that way. And, uh, and the person my, that my, mentioned... My comment on that is that that will work on a strong colony, but not on a weak colony. Okay. Um, uh, so that, that, the, the, the person who called, commented earlier about their colonies being a small nuke, that powdered sugar system isn't going to work for them because they're going to have a lot of trouble liquefying it. And um, you'll end up uh, having a dead colony that You've got all that powdered sugar that'll kind of cake up, or all that sugar that'll cake up in the spring. It'll end up on the ground, and you've got another mess. Okay. Um, so, I uh, yes, I have used powdered sugar. I just pour it on the inner cover just to keep colonies alive. We go back to some of my old Ohio State University etc. publications, and I'm quoted. I wrote it. Yeah, yeah, it works, but it's for strong colonies only, and I usually do it late in the later in the, in the winter, early in the spring. By the way, question, what month do most bee colonies die in the north? Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a guess and say in the north, probably March. Yeah, March and April. People, people think that once the, 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 some of the early spring flowers bloom, they're out of, the, out of trouble. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mother Nature, of course, will give us some really rough weather, and then we've got to deal with it as a result. Uh, let's see here. We've um, we've got a question about how much cold weather can a small uh, nuke take um, before you should uh, try and insulate it somehow. And then also uh, along those same lines, what do you think about bringing nukes into greenhouses uh, over the winter? Let me answer that, that last question first. No, don't do it. Okay. Uh, greenhouses are notoriously bad ways to, to winter bees because um, the bees kind of beat themselves up on the glass and <laughs> they get stressed. You get a real problem with those sea mite greenhouses. So, yeah, I wouldn't do it. I would be more inclined to do this with nukes if I've got more than one. I would uh, bundle them together in twos and fours and then maybe wrap them up, uh, put some uh, insulation material on the top and wrap them in uh, roofing paper. And the biggest thing about nukes is to get them out of the wind. 
Uh, people think that uh, that vocation that was so great during the summer will be good in the, in the winter. And it's often the case that uh, you need to get good wind protection. And uh, if you can go out on a, on a winter day in a jacket and you're comfortable where the nukes are and the colonies are, that's probably a good position. If you're freezing yourself, then your colony should have been put somewhere else. I'm um, curious if anybody's doing any inside wintering. Anyone doing accelerating technique? Anyone doing inside wintering out there? While we wait for people to to respond to that, um, a question that we get all the time is, how do you know when uh, your nuke is strong enough to move into a, a full size hive? And actually, before that, actually. We've got a question about why even start a nuke? Why not just put them in a full-size box? I, I think the main reason that we put bees into nukes is uh, energy conservation because it's easier for them to, uh, in that smaller area, they, I mean, yeah, I know about the concept of the clustering, but they also kind of keep that area patrolled. If you give, uh, put two frames of brood, and a frame of honey into a 10 frame box, it's pretty vacuous in there. And so they're better off being kind of held down. It'd be easier for them to maintain that core temperature, the brood temperature. And um, to, to get back to the question about how do you know it's time, I'd say that when you've got brood on the uh, four of the five frames or three of the four frames, it's time to move them over into 10 frame equipment. It's a transition phase, you know, my daughter's got the baby in her, her bassinet before she puts it into the crib. You know, maybe this is strictly a human behavior, and the bees don't really give it. You know, sometimes care about it. But, sometimes the parents have to just let go of the little nuke and and accept it growing into a full size colony. Is that what you're saying? Full size colony, yes. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. Uh, Seems like you just went through that, haven't you? Uh, well, yeah, sort of. We're, we've got another one on the way, though. <laughs> keep us keep us in that nuke phase for a while longer. <laughs> the increased part of your life. That's right. That's right. Well, Larry, we uh, we we still have a couple questions hanging out there, but uh, uh, I'm I'm always reluctant to uh, uh, take up too much uh, time of our guest speakers. Um, I'm going to try and. Uh, uh, get to these uh, a little later on, maybe tomorrow morning or something. But uh, there is there is uh, one question that um, I'll pose to you on the way out here, which uh, will give you one last opportunity for shameless plugs. Um, that uh, uh, this person, uh, Michael, has been trying to take uh, excellent notes, but of course there's just been tons of information, and was wondering if most of this information that you presented this evening is contained in your book Increase Essentials. That's a real question. I'm not making that up. Um, and uh, Larry, this will give you one opportunity to just do the shameless plug. But also, I'll say that I always record these and uh, post them up to our website, so uh, there'll be an opportunity to view it at your leisure also in the future. Uh, but Larry, go ahead. Why don't you uh, take this opportunity to just plug? Well, actually, plug the actually not everything I've said tonight is in the book because you know I'm. I'm freely admitting that uh, my learning curve continues after 47 years with beekeeping. And uh, I wrote uh, Increase Essentials in, 19, in, in, in 06. So here it is, three, a little over three years later, almost four years since I wrote it. Um, yeah, I've grown. Most of this information is in the book. You know, don't, don't make me scare you off from buying a copy. You need to have a copy. Um, you need two copies, one for in the house and one for the yard. The, uh, and I've been told that. People say, I need two copies. And then, then, then there are the people that, well, I, actually the book has been used by a number of bee clubs as, as uh, their program, that they've used that in their bee schools and so forth. So that's been really uh, kind of exciting to see that. I, uh, I think that um, as we move forward with the whole development of the, what I call it, the, the move toward uh, revising the way we do things. Um, you know, we'll see more and more beekeepers nukes their first year. And it'll be just part of regular beekeeping that you get a setup hive that includes a nuke and instructions of when you need to use it and how to do it. Uh, 
I've had with my classes, uh, I think everybody in my class has learned the, the advantage of having an extra hive, an extra queen on board. Um, not that they're too bad, but we've, we've had a, a tough year. So having those uh, nymphs has been really useful. The basics are very simple for making nymphs, just like the basics for queen rearing are real simple. It's the confidence that it takes for you to build in your, your own abilities to do some of these things and, um, and have fun with them. And that's, that's my bottom line. You've got to maintain uh, some fun with the beekeeping and not be overwhelmed by what seems like a, a huge amount to learn. And I tell my students that uh, the only way you're going to go out there is to try something, and if it doesn't work, now you know what doesn't work. So um, you might do some things that don't work so well. The other thing is that uh, uh, I learn so much from the students that I teach that uh, it's, uh, it's very gratifying to have uh, that kind of contact and uh, feedback. So I do appreciate feedback from people who read my books and hear my talks, and read my articles, and pull up with my general annoying sort of personality. <laughs> so it's been fun. It's good. Well, good. I, um, you know, I'm I'm reminded of uh, I, I, several people, I guess, over over my career in beekeeping have have reminded me that uh, anyone who ever tells you they know everything there is to know about beekeeping has uh, has already committed their first lie to you, um, because it is a sort of one of those things that you could spend your whole life doing, and and still uh, you're humbled by those bees uh, on a fairly frequent basis. Um, so uh, I'm just going to warn all those, those beekeepers that are there in their second year of beekeeping. Um, that tends to be the most dangerous year when you start the second year, second season of beekeeping, because that's when you think you figured it all out. <laughs> you got all the answers, and in your third year, you realize you weren't as smart as you thought you were. <laughs> in your fortieth year you realize you haven't learned anything yet. <laughs> <laughs> so those are excellent, uh, excellent parting words, especially for those uh, beekeepers that uh, I think it was 30 some odd percent that are in their first year. Remember those words as you round the corner and go into spring uh, next year. But, uh, but, but, but enjoy, enjoy being a beekeeper. It is absolutely. a wonderful thing to do. And the thing is that I, I'm always amazed by the enthusiasm of those first, second, third year beekeepers. But it's even more exciting to see somebody who's been keeping bees for as long as I have who's just as enthusiastic. So, you know, have a good time and uh, start, start putting those nuke boxes together. I want to <laughs> see a lot of people selling nukes next year. Well, can I stand with one story? Jane? What's that? I, can, I have one sh a closing story. Feel free. All right, I was in, in uh, Kentucky, and my book had been out for a year. And a young man came up to me and said, I bought your book last year. And I said, good, good, you read it. He said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, he kind of paused. And I'm always worried about somebody who pauses when they're having a conversation. And he says, well, I made up 24 nukes. And I, I was pretty impressed. I said, oh, well, how'd they go through the winter? He said, well, I got 23 of them come through the winter. Now, this was March. She wasn't through with winter yet, in my estimation. And I said, is there a problem with that? He said, what the heck am I going to do with 23 colonies? <laughs> so there was, there was one of the, the meeting planners that overheard this conversation, and she went and grabbed another name badge, one of those peel-off badges, it said, I have nukes for sale, and by 10 o'clock that morning, you sold all 23 of those nukes. <laughs> so there, there's, there's sort of a motivation of sorts for, for getting into making inquiries. And with that, I'll shut up. Thank you. Well, thank you, Larry. And actually, that addressed perfectly one of the questions that uh, was asked but didn't get, uh, or was posed but not asked, which was, so if you make a split to reduce swarming, what do you do with that split? Uh, later on in the year if you don't actually want to increase your colony numbers. And so uh, that story answered that fairly well. So thank you very much. And Larry, thank you very much again for taking some time with us this evening. 
Um, your, uh, your wealth of knowledge is always a pleasure uh, to just glean just as, as much as we can. Um, you certainly have a, a lot of experience uh, behind you and your travels and meeting with uh, various beekeepers and seeing how they're doing things uh, certainly uh, only contributes to all that information that you've shared with us this evening and, and also share with us in your articles and the magazines and such. So thank you very, very much, uh, Larry. I surely do appreciate it. Um, and thank you all for, uh, for tuning in this evening. And I'll just remind you that we've got another one coming up next week with, uh, with Larry Tarpey talking about, um, about queen quality. So uh, uh, did I just say Larry Tarpey? I'm sorry, yeah, Dave. Did. Did. <laughs> I'm confusing yeah. the two. It's, my, it's getting late in the Tarpey, evening. So. Uh, it's Dave Tarpey. I'm a Dave Tarpey, so I plan on uh, listening to that one too. He's a he's His a. stuff is always really good. Yeah, he's got some really great information. I'm sure that'll be very interesting as well. So thank you again, Larry. I appreciate it, and we'll be in You're touch. Welcome. Thank have you. Have a good Have a good evening. Good night. Bye. Okay. Take care.